Hi, Shuyi, it's Merlin. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so people oh, know who we are? Sure. Hi, I'm Shuyi Scott. I'm a cello teacher and I live in Austin, Texas. I love teaching my students and I love coaching teachers. Um, if you'd like to know more about me, just go to shuicello.com. And how about Merlin? Nice. So I'm Merlin Thompson. I also have a website. It's at merlinthompson.com. And I have a podcast series there. It's called The Music Educator's Crucible. There's lots of inspiration for uh, and information for teachers on a variety of topics. And uh, who am I? I'm a piano teacher. I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Ooh, very cold and it's very warm here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Should we talk about how we started our conversation a little bit so our anybody listening can get some idea? Sure. So if I remember correctly, it's something like maybe June of 2020. And we got together for the first time to talk about uh, all kinds of things related to music teaching. Such a great treat during this pandemic quarantine and everything's online. I just feel like the good ideas we uh, came up with during our dialogue, I thought it would be nice to share them with, with teachers who might be interested. Yeah, and I really, I really appreciate your idea because I can see that there are lots of things that are going through teachers' minds. And sometimes listening in on a conversation between people like you and I can be a really valuable thing for them to do. So I think for a very busy studio teacher or for an orchestra teacher, we have um, lots of paperwork to do and still have to meet some guidelines. Hopefully listen to our conversation can give them some, oh, I'm okay. I have a time to breathe for my brain, <laughs> that kind of stuff. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, because being a, because teaching is a challenging environment, you know, no matter how many years you've been teaching. Um, and to know kind of what other people are doing, I think is always really valuable, mostly because as teachers, we're always working on our own. So the opportunity to actually find out what other people are doing, very valuable. Yeah. So I'm really excited. I hope our conversation will keep going and get more teachers to share their thoughts and, uh, and questions so we can have more and more learning experience for, for both of us and for everybody in the teachers community. Sounds good. Absolutely great. So one of them like just came out recently is she's teaching a five-year-old and the five-year-old uh, refuses the parent's help and they're online. Yeah, so it's a matter of student ownership and independence for sure. And letting the student take the lead, following the student's lead. Yeah, so it is following the student. Um, and giving the student permission, I think, to take the direction in, in multiple ways. So to take the direction in a good direction and to take the direction in the not good direction. So that way, you know that the student understands that certain things are advantageous and certain other things are not advantageous. Right. So it's not just about does the student catch on how to do it perfectly or even right, but it's... Uh, does the student catch on the difference between a light sound or a straight bow and a crooked bow or, you know, those kinds of things? Right. Uh, I think it's very, it's, you no, know, it's easily for adults to, to put it as teacher and the parent on one side and student on the other side. Because, because the, I think the way it's presented is I want to help the student, but the student refuses help. Like a very binary. So I don't think it's a binary yeah. no. issue, right? How would you translate your principles in, in action? Yeah, truly it is accepting the student mm -hmm. for who they are and accepting what they have to offer and allowing the student to expand on what they can offer. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the last one a little bit? 
So it's just the idea that, you know, students have more than one way of doing things all the time. Right. And uh, I think somehow we get the impression that they only have one way of doing things. And it might be the right or the wrong way. But I suspect they have lots of different ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And so it's really to empower students to use their imagination, uh, to explore multiple solutions to various problems, or even just multiple solutions to how you're going to play this piece. Mm -hmm. And then through that, it's like you kind of gain what the student's knowledge base is, and you can start building on what the student knows, as opposed to thinking, oh, this student doesn't know how to do things well. I've got to get the parents' assistance in in order for that to happen. Right. But it's just too many steps. Right. So if you go directly to the student, yeah. So doesn't that also reflect to, you know, if a teacher has more than one layer or more than one levels of expectations, then maybe the teacher will, is willing to challenge herself uh, about they might be there might be different possibilities from a student's outcome. I think a lot of times we expect I teach this that happen it happens there, and now it's not happening there. So I need the parent to make it happen there. Right. The parent right. doesn't cannot make it happen because a student no. refuses the parent's uh, help. So then there's like I I'm doing this. He's not doing that. And here's a yes and there's a no. So when if you if a teacher sees it's yes and no, then there's no commonplace, right? And I yeah. think that's the challenge, like just like what you said, because what you're saying is is that the teacher herself would already be prepared for all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. And that having the having that ability is, I think it. Uh, teachers need to practice. Don't you? Yeah, I call it multiple ownership is what I call it. Mm. I've used this word for a long time, multiple ownership. So when students have multiple ownership, mm. it means that they have lots of ways of coming to the instrument, lots of ways of bringing the instrument to, the, or at least more than one way of bringing the instrument to life. Mm. And out of those ways, certain ones are going to be valuable for the long term, Certain ones are just going to be valuable for the short term because they engage students' participation. So if you get students' participation for the short term, that's a great thing. It doesn't have to be something that you want to take, you know, for the next 10 years and you see that you're setting them up to play the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. It can be just, have I got this student's engagement right now? That, I think what, what you just said is pretty complex already because then it's not just at this moment... Uh, having the tools from the teacher side to make a student comply, but also the teachers need the teachers need to have this um, kind of a um, the teacher should have a planner in in her head for the, each student. Like this planner can it needs to be a weekly planner and the yearly planner. And so right. if you look at the yearly planner uh, idea, then with a little mischievous, it wouldn't feel as a big catastrophe <laughs> you know right. the way i coach my uh, teachers would be like um setting a priority can you get the student's mind to be engaged with you rather than listen to you or not listening to you right but it's yeah. just having a conversation so if the ball hold is not very good right now um uh, if somehow you can uh, have a story or have a game to talk about the boho and talk, you know, what does this work and how do you hold a teapot to pour some tea, uh, different ways to describe how to use your hand yeah. and um, maybe that will bring in, so maybe use a common experience, common life experiences to mm -hmm. have a conversation with a student so that it's not just do it or not do it. Right. You know, so I think this do it or not do it from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen just sounds really daunting, right? Yeah, and you did mention one thing. I, I came up with this a, a couple of months ago. Somebody asked me, how do you know when a student is ready to go on to the next piece? Yeah, and I, I came up with three things. 
that there's technique, interpretation, and mindset. Mm-hmm. So uh, those three, those three, three are three things that teachers can work on. You can work on something technical. If you're not getting any success there, you can work on something interpretive. If you're not getting any success there, maybe it's the mindset and the student's not engaged. So you need to find something that can engage the student to open the door so that then you might work on something technical or something something interpretational. I like that you have these three items, uh, technique, and interpretation, and mindset. So if you are facing a student who's reluctant to you know, to be with you in a lesson, yeah. which one will be your priority then? Yeah, so the first thing is the mindset then, nice. isn't it? Yeah. 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 But, but in order to, but the mindset might be the one that's the most inflexible at the moment because they've decided, oh, I'm not going to do anything that this guy's got to offer. So you might have to go to the technical thing because something technical might be really easy to do. And because it's easy to do, then you get the child as a participant. But what you are doing technically doesn't really have anything to do with the problem you're trying to solve. You're not trying to solve a technical problem or or you're not trying to solve that particular problem. But because you use something that the student can do that is easy, then it helps them to adjust their mindset. So they they become the flexible person that you're hoping to work with. So. They, they do overlap. They're not really independent. Right, uh, right. And sometimes I, like, I even think that, you know, where the problem is, if the problem is a technical one, don't fix it technically. Fix it with mindset. If the problem is a mindset one, fix it with interpretation, you know. So go somewhere else. Don't try to fix the problem where it is. I like that idea, yeah, because I think it's so much easier to... To try to address the issue directly, right? And um, but like you said, if if a student is having a hard time to focus, and you can go back to just doing a posture song and uh, start from something that maybe maybe starting from something the student doesn't feel threatened, and yes. and then that might help the student to soft to make you know soften. Uh, his attitude or his, just his mindset will be more relaxed and then then you can go on to talk about mindset differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. And often I think, you know, in a Suzuki lesson um, setting, of course we start our lesson with taking a bow, I'm ready to learn. And when kids say that, that could become a uh, that could become part of the ritual, but it doesn't, it's not reality, <laughs> right? <laughs> says, I'm ready to learn, but I'm yeah. actually not. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think if, yeah. if a, so I think as a, uh, I know, modern time uh, music teachers, we, we shouldn't take that as granted when the kids say, I'm ready to learn. And okay, that means that does not equate to uh, the student is ready to copy the teacher for the whole 30 minutes or 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, right. I think that that can be, so then in this case, the teacher's mindset is here and the student's mindset is here. Um, perhaps that, um, like, yeah. So the, that needs to be, especially I think on for online lessons, mm-hmm. so, so much difficulty going on right now. Um, that seems to be the part that I, I feel I need to spend the first five ten minutes to warm up, um, with their mindset and my mindset because I need to know, uh, you know how difficult it has been for for a certain student or is it easier? Um, I think part of our challenge is also that we that our definition of learning is quite narrow, so. Um, that we like to think of learning as, as, well, I was doing this yesterday, so it's going to be better today, and it's going to be better tomorrow, and it's going to be even better the next day. Oh, and I better not miss a day, because if I do, then my learning's going to go down track. You know, for me, I keep coming to all the research now that's talking about um, this much more nuanced version of, of, of learning. And even, I think in my last podcast, I talk about learning as forgetting, revisiting, refining, plateauing, 
confusion, um, internalization, you know, so there's all those steps involved. And, but somehow because we, 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 we were looking for stable learning environments. We're looking to create stability in learning, but the very word stability somehow doesn't really factor in with learning because learning is this unstable kind of ebb and flow thing. So when a student says, I'm ready to learn, I think we might, we might want to translate to that to say, I'm ready that things may go according to plan and not. Yes, <laughs> I think that's a really good um, reminder, uh, at least for, for the teacher and, and the, uh, for the adults in the room, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I like, for example, lately, one of my really hardworking five-year-olds, um, he's getting stuck with the etude, you know, that's just because it's very complex and um, he's not as a as analytical as me. He's not very analytical at all. Of course, they're young kids. Right. Um, but and then he practiced really hard. So I, I see that the mom uh, was always disappointed because I can see that her idea is that the practice should be the trajectory yes. of practice and performance should be like this. And yeah. um, uh, I, I need a, I found myself uh, comforting and explaining to the mom more than the child um, so that so that we can work together. Um, yeah that's um, yeah that's always yeah. something new that we're learning from from a student or from a parent. Yeah, so we're on a journey how all of us how as human beings, that this desire for stability and security, and I would say even predictability, mm -hmm. is so ingrained in us. You know, I, I was thinking, yeah, where, where does that show up in my life? Well, I like to sleep in my own bed every night. I like to eat foods that are familiar and comfortable regularly. And I also like speaking English. And why do I like speaking English? Because I can express myself well. Mm -hmm. And so... This idea of safety and security, you know, there are all these places that reinforce it for us in daily life. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy for us to think that that's what we're supposed to be aspiring to. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I was thinking also the other day, uh, we have the Protestant work ethic is one thing. Mm -hmm. So where does Protestant work ethic comes? Well, it says if you work really hard, you'll get better and better and better doing things. You'll make more money. OK, mm -hmm. so that's desirable. And then on the other hand, we have the Asian discipline idea, which says that if you are a disciplined individual, you will overcome your weaknesses. And so even with that, I see there are these huge social factors that are influencing how we think about what we do in positive and negative ways. So we're putting judgment on, oh, yeah, no, I didn't work really hard yesterday. Oh, am I, does that mean I'm a bad person? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, right, exactly. Um that's you know, all these big pictures of uh, you put good work, you have good outcome. It sounds like it just directly goes to the, the result right. like that. But <laughs> that's why I, I, I found out when you talked about um, the messiness and the plateau uh, in the learning process, that's those really, especially uh, from watching how a child learn, uh, struggling part is, is really, I feel that's the part we tend to forget to celebrate. I know it sounds weird to celebrate struggling. That that's weird, but I I really uh, agree with what you said. You know, the messiness and the confusion and the plateau. These are actually where the the I think that's where the deep learning occurs. Also, you no. Know, perhaps you think it could be the the parents' love for a child. When you know we we always hate to see our now I would hate to see my daughters struggle, and when they struggle we just feel oh no you know I I want to make sure I find you a path that was that smoother. So how do, how would you help a parent to see the merit of struggling? <laughs> yeah, I think parents somewhat already know about it, seeing their children struggle. Um, in other ways, you know, learning to walk, learning to talk, learning to get dressed. Um, and the thing about those struggles that are that are in the child's life is that the parent is there to, to comfort. So they get they develop this relationship. Oh, yeah, 
child's going to encounter a struggle, but mom and dad are going to be there to, to you know, to comfort me. Um, but you see, I think part of what happens is that parents may fall into the trap of saying things like, don't worry, everything's all right. Mm. And for me, that's a contradiction of what's going on. Mm. So the don't worry is good advice. Um, for me, I, that's, a, you know, you fell down, you scraped your, your knee, you know, don't worry, everything, but the everything was all right is not the next follow-up statement. Mm. The next follow-up statement is, how you're feeling right now is completely appropriate to this situation. And if we can get in the habit of saying that, as opposed to everything's all right, which kind of denies what the student's feeling. So if a student falls down and is upset, and the parent says, oh, there's no reason to be upset. Well, it's like you look at the person and go, are you real? Can you not see I'm suffering here? You, the person who should understand me the most in life, have just said something that completely does not match this situation. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's those kinds of things that we've gotten in, in, as adults into the habit of comforting people by pointing them in, in what we think is the positive direction. But maybe... We, our comfort for them will be more accurate if we allow, you know, the person who's suffering, if, if we go with them to where they are, as opposed to taking them to some other place. So in my case, most of the time, uh, I, I do have, I don't have, you know, not that all my three to five year old students are perfectly, uh, you know, behaving every, you know, every lesson. And a lot of the time they will be, similar i don't mom i don't need your help i know what i know what a straight bow is uh, even though they will be doing yeah. straight bow like this or straight bow like that <laughs> that's their definition of about straight um um so the parents there is trying to help the student doesn't want the parents help the teacher is trying to help um the equation <laughs> It's not there. It's like they're all isolated, but um, yeah. So, so a lot of time I would say, right now your your parent, your mom is is being me. Uh, your mom is the my third hand. Is my third eye. So it's me asking your mom to help me. Your mom is not helping you. Your mom is helping me. Sometimes that that introduction helps. For the student to um, to ch kind of have an option to change his position, and the other thing, I sometimes use uh, an, a stuffed animal. If uh, you know, have your if your hippopotamus says your bow is straight, is your is is did he say it's straight or or not? Um, or have the mom hold the hippopotamus and let the hippopotamus talk instead of right. the mom. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just yeah I've been I don't know why I've been brainstorming thinking how what would be other ways to address. I think one of the things that I like to do is ask the child. Um, it it has to do with permission, and asking the child for permission for for mom or dad to assist. Mm -hmm. So you know, to take it out of the assumption place to say that, you know, your mom's there and I really need her help. Oh, but I need your permission. Mm -hmm. And for me, it can be really interesting what happens next because the child could say no. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, I don't want my mom's help. But you could ask at that point, why? And you might find out, well, my mom is always too fast or my, or my dad's too slow or he doesn't use a nice voice when he talks to me. So, so you get more information as opposed to just trying to talk the child into something else. But you, you kind of go behind the details and find out, oh, what is their relationship really like? Because if the dad does just kind of use, or, you know, ordering around language, well, even I, I wouldn't want to be a part of that. Um, you know, so, so asking the child for permission um, is, is a great one. And um, you see, for me, there are also things like you could put a, a time limit on for the next three minutes. Um, can we ask for permission for your mom to help out or the next one minute 
or, you know, or next week, can we put it off? You know, so to just put it in a different place that gives the child again, then that idea that they own what's going on in this process. Like, I, I really like your your uh, reminder about uh, permission part, asking for permission. And from perhaps from there, you'll uh, be able to um, gain more information. I think there's a, a yeah. lack of information here because yeah. there's a lot of assumptions. Probably the teacher assumed the student does not want the parents to help 100%, but maybe it's 60%. Right. It's eighty percent. So maybe our job is to find out how much, uh, how, if if the how dominant the parents are or how dominant the student is, and then from there to find out a common place that will work for for this lesson. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely not a dichotomy. I I think this that's the part that when I'm coaching new teachers, uh, that's the part like. I feel I need to give a lot of tool in, in their toolbox is uh, nothing is black and white. Uh, and then during the gray area, there are many different shades of gray. <laughs> yes. And for each gray, you'll have a different toolbox uh, for having a conversation. Even just having a mindset, just talk about how they feel about practice or lessons or, or just even just talk about um, how easy or how difficult a piece is could be part of learning right it's um it's not um it's not just demo copy demo copy right right uh, assignment done this whole universe of teaching <laughs> that um that's challenging is yeah i like what you said you know it's such with this demo you copy demo you copy there's great value in that but I always kind of come back to what seeds am I sowing that I'm going to be able to use for long-term development? Mm -hmm. And seeds that I want to, to sow are our relationship, that we're going to work together, that we're going to listen to each other. So that may mean that I have to listen to certain things that I might, you know, for a 14-year-old who's been playing for seven years, really may not be all that interested in listening to. But for a beginning student who is five, yeah, I'm going to listen to this stuff because I am I want to develop this relationship. And for me, it's more important that I sow the seeds of how we're going to interact with each other than just get into the demonstrate, you copy, demonstrate, you copy idea. Yeah, I, yeah, I really think that's where the great teachers uh make that huge difference it's between demonstration and Im imitation there's actually way yeah. more like you say short term long term mindset or it could be interpretation and, and it could be just techniques but a lot of the time we jump onto techniques right away right and thinking that the mindset yeah. is already the, um, the mindset part is presumed it's it should be there and then, uh, <laughs> then we spend a lot of time on the techniques, and then we think that interpretation will somehow come naturally sometime later. Right. Uh, actually, yeah. like you said, these three things, it's always going uh, going there, and uh, it's like the student's mind is always visiting these three areas all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, if we, if teachers challenge ourselves to think about oh how do I put these three things on a plate and you know think about like a, a menu planning <laughs> or you know sometimes it could be like a Japanese style uh, plate you have a tiny little plates everything or sometimes it could be a Western style you have one course and then next course <laughs> and then next course um, sometimes it could be a international buffet <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. and uh, kids want to take it in a different way and uh, yeah I don't know why I'm talking about food but, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that's a fun part about teaching because it's just so it has it's this element of improvisation there that um, perhaps actually for teachers especially new teachers uh, take it a, a huge challenge right because oh it's not going as I planned what should I do <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Cause, because, like, 
going back your going back to your five layers, it's um it's really it's a good practice for a teacher's mindset. Like, have you considered all these possibilities, and have you thought about um, in our teaching, we can touch upon on all the layers. Um, yeah. Why why do they matter? Um, I think it it helps. Um, when I listen to it, it helps me to think about you know just it has helped me to calm down and and start really thinking about the long term and thinking about the bigger picture of a student. Um, and then I think that's how we we make our teaching more profound. We start thinking that we could influence a student in the long term rather than this week and next week. Um, yeah. <laughs>